Welcome back to the fourth video in a series where we overanalyze the info we got from Togashi, covering the various NAN categorizations and proficiency levels of a number of characters. In this video, we'll be tackling the info provided to us about conjurers. So let's get into it. Let's kick things off with the least represented member of the Phantom Troop, Cortopi. It got dark here. Wow. The walking, sometimes talking mop is a pure conjurer, which is entirely to be expected. The dude's only ability we've seen is Gallery Fake, which allows him to create inanimate copies of things he touches, which disappear after 24 hours and also function as an extension of his N. This is entirely a conjuration-based ability with added limitations and effects, so he's definitely the perfect exemplar of pure conjuration. As far as proficiency goes, the little spawn of Cthulhu is, like the majority of troop members we got ratings for, rated at natural, the third highest rank. While it's obvious that combat wasn't his strong suit, is physically the weakest among the troop members, hasn't fought on screen once, and his lack of combat prowess was stated in the series itself, as far as conjuration is concerned, the guy knew what he was doing. He could create perfect copies of any object he touched. Keep in mind, Kropika's training implied that even conjuring a single object takes immense practice, in the beginning at least, had enough aura reserves and or his ability was efficient enough to the point where he could have created over 50 copies of the troop's York New Hideout, and each of the objects he materialized independently function as an extension of his N. While a technicality and not an actual application of N as a skill, this feat would dwarf Zeno's 300 meter N and even go beyond what Pito had been shown to do. I uh, had a few jokes with which to end his segment on, but you know what? Let's end it on a high note. Cortopia did what he focused on doing really damn well. Speaking of mops, let's move on to man's best friend, most hated domestic appliance. The Vacuum Cleaner. Another pure conjurer and a fellow troop member is Shizuku Murasaki. Shizuku is another great example of pure conjuration, since we've also seen her use only one ability thus far, and that's to summon Blinky, which is capable of inhaling an effectively infinite amount of non-living objects not created through Nen. Whether you're looking to clean up a crime scene, bust some heads, or drain a perverted old man's spider ant of all his fluids, Blinky can handle all of it and more. Alone time will never be the same again. Moving on, her proficiency ranking is at Skillful, the lowest rank. I was slightly surprised by this, since I was expecting her to be around excellent, personally. Shizuku isn't particularly combat-oriented, much like Rotopi, in neither personality nor Hatsu. The Hatsu itself, while being of amazing utility for a thieving group like the troop, is quite a bit limited, as even though Blinky can suck in an indefinite amount of objects or materials, and can even suck out poison or other foreign matter from a person's body, the ability is still quite restricted in that she cannot influence living things, conjured objects, and can only retrieve what Blinky sucked in last. I personally like to imagine everything else just gets dumped somewhere in Meteor City, constantly adding to the heaps of already soaring mountains of garbage. Despite both her and Cortopi having a rather specialized, not special list, pure conjuration Hatsu, Tugashi has designated Cortopi as being quite a bit more advanced than her. This is most likely because of the massive difference in the scale of the two abilities. As in Cortopi could single-handedly, or two-handedly, end the housing crisis of any major city on the planet in a matter of minutes, while also peeping on each and every one of his new tenants. He'd just need to redo it every 24 hours if he wanted the conditions of the ability to remain the same. Also, he was so skilled in conjuration that he could copy-paste almost anything, and to such an extent that he could create perfectly detailed copies of human bodies, which could then be further mutilated to make them look convincingly... deader since they were already non-living. Another possibility, and I personally do not believe this to be the case, is that Blinky is actually on a similar level to Gallery Fake, and that Chizuku's potential is simply much vaster than Kurtopi's, and that she's only begun to actually tap into it. Next, let's tackle everyone's least favorite main villain from a major arc, Genthru. Alright, I'm not gonna lie, I'm just gonna use this section to talk about just how genuinely stupid he is. So, Genthru is inexplicably a pure conjurer. I say inexplicably because the man has two abilities, Countdown and Little Flower. With Countdown, he needs to touch someone while saying the word Bomber, and explain the conditions of his ability, not at the same time, mind you, in order to trigger the Countdown, which begins at 6000 and is directly tied to the victim's pulse. Little Flower is a mini explosion he can create through his hands by grabbing someone. Okay, Countdown is primarily a conjuration-based ability. Fair enough, he's actually conjuring an explosive device with conditions and limitations attached to it. Sure, 
Little Flower, on the other hand, is pure transmutation. It's his offensive go to when countdown isn't an option. Now, as a pure conjurer, Genthru would have an 80% proficiency for transmutation. Alright, that's decent enough. However, since he's not using emission, the explosions are happening point blank. So he has to coat his own hands with more aura than the amount used to create the explosions, which are already happening in 80% efficiency. You see, unlike Bakugo, again through and most transmuters don't have a free pass of simply being immune to the substances and reactions they generate. Can we also just take a pause here and notice how similar, but also not, Bakugo and Genthru are? It's mostly the ability and hair, but they definitely do share a similar arrogance, smugness, and just general punchability. Back on topic, if Genthru was not fighting a literal child who had just started learning Nen and had yet to actually master the more advanced aspects of Nen, primarily Ryu, i.e. the principle of using Ko and Gyo to distribute aura in real time, Genthru would not be able to do Jack in a one-on-one -on -one fight against someone even close to his own caliber. Like seriously, his ability sucks. Let's say he uses 30% aura to create a blast, he'd need to use around 35% to coat his hand so that he doesn't get blown up as well. That's 65% of his aura going into an attack that's actually using less than half of that to create the explosion. Even if he does use feints like he did with Gon, as in focusing 40% aura in his right hand but actually creating an explosion through his left at 25% power, this means nothing if the person he's fighting is anywhere near his level of combat prowess and aura capacity. Why? Because they need to code the area he's touching in half as much aura he's using. So even if he does faint, it's fine because the opponent is literally expanding half as much aura to defend as he is to attack. Sure, they may take some damage in the process, but they'd whoop him in the meantime, just by, for example, bashing his brains in. Note that he only has a 60% affinity for enhancement, and an enhancer of equal prowess could probably end him in a good hit or two, since they have the benefit of not using more than half their aura to defend themselves against their own abilities. Plus, they would be attacking at 100% efficiency, unlike Genthru's 80%. My point is, unless they're literally children or simply way below his level, enhancers are Genthru's worst nightmare. Non-enhancers, on the other hand, would wipe the floor with Genthru by simply using their own non-idiotic Hatsu, though I'm pretty sure most emitters and transmuters could get away with just caving his face in as well. Now, considering he's showcased only two abilities, one of which is pure transmutation, I had really expected him to be, if not transmutation midpoint, then at least transmutation lean. As far as proficiency goes, Genthru is inexplicably at natural, on the level of powerhouses like Hisoka, Krollo and... Silva, yeah, no, he's definitely not. I'll simply reiterate that these proficiency levels are not absolute, but are relative to an individual and their level of talent. As such, greater potential means that a greater threshold needs to be met for a character to reach a specific proficiency level. Genthru was simply pretty close to reaching his maximum potential, which is... just... sad. As somewhat of a palate cleanser, let's move on to a character I actually really like, but has driven me insane as I consider the implications this new info necessitates. Knucklebine. Who is somehow a pure conjurer? Since I do like him, I won't harp on him too much about the fact that his ability, Akuware, is actually stupider than Genthru's Little Flower. Akuware entails Knuckle apparently conjuring and not emitting APR, an indestructible Nen construct which appears next to and continues to follow the selected target after the condition of Knuckle hitting them with an attack is fulfilled. As long as the target remains within the effective range of 50 meters, retconned from 100, APR will lend Knuckle's aura to his opponent at an added interest of 10% every 10 seconds. This will continue until a the target is outside effective range, at which time APR will remain latched on but will pause accruing interest, or b until the target's indebted aura exceeds their current remaining aura, i.e. they no longer have the capacity to pay the accrued debt, at which point APR turns into IRS and they go into bankruptcy, i.e. are forced into a state of Zetsu for 30 days. 
So, we were for the longest time under the impression that Knuckle was an emitter. Apart from the Hunter x Hunter manual from the Yu Hakusho official character book stating so, we also had a bunch of other reasons to think this was the case. First and foremost, the basis of his ability, Hakuware, is emission. Apart from intuitively making sense that transferring aura from one person to another entails emission, we also now have a precedent in the form of Merum's Aura Synthesis, unofficial name, which allows him to absorb the Nen of others by turning them into a Happy Meal. Look at that face. That's a happy face. The exhibition has also confirmed that Meruem is a pure emitter, so we can deduce, for reasons further elaborated on in the previous video covering emitters, that this is a purely emission-based ability and category mechanic. Secondly, him being an emitter made sense because a PR could be explained as being an emitted Nen beast, like Razor's Devils or Gorenu's uh, Gorenus. I don't believe APR was ever around non-NEN users, correct me if I'm wrong, so we have no way of knowing whether or not it can be seen by regular people, which is the main difference between emitted and conjured entities. Third, Knuckle is a brawler who really likes to get up close and personal to his opponent whenever it's a viable strategic option to do so. As mentioned in every video thus far, enhancement is a must in end hand-to-hand -hand combat, and emitters enjoy an 80% proficiency in it. Fourth, he's a pretty good match for how Hisoka describes the average emitter, i.e. easy to rile up, though he also describes them as not being detail-oriented, and Knuckle is actually quite a planner and tactician when you look back on it, even though he does still let his feelings get the better of him, even in life or death situations, such as when he wanted to get a punch in on UP for dissing Shoot's resolve. In any case, the only ones who still consider Hisoka's Nen type and personality correlation test as valid is the fanbase, or small parts thereof, at least, since Togashi went on to discredit it in the same chapter it was introduced. Apart from one thing, which we'll cover in a moment, everything he did was an excellent match for the category of emission. But my dude's a conjurer, the exact opposite category. Let's analyze that, shall we? So, since he's directly opposite of emission and is a pure conjurer, this means he'd only have a 40% aptitude for emission, which in turn entails a few things. A. APR's 10% interest rate could potentially have been as high as 25 were Knuckle to have a 100% aptitude for emission. This would have meant that he could trigger bankruptcy much more quickly, while presumably maintaining all the same base conditions. B, his effective range for APR accumulating interest could have been more than double what it actually was. And C, since he would have had increased proficiency in enhancement, each punch would have transferred a decently greater amount of aura. With that said, I can think of only one upside to him being a pure conjurer. Since APR is conjured and not emitted, this makes it easier to create conditions which entail things like invulnerability. Since both conjuration and manipulation are the two categories, specialization excluded, most prone to incorporating conditions and additional specific effects. The fact that APR sticks to a person no matter how far away they are from Knuckle, although it does stop adding on interest, speaks to it being emission-based, though conjured objects can also maintain their form far away from the user if the necessary conditions are applied. I assume the conditions would have to be far more costly with conjuration than with emission though, and considering APR is still invincible while outside Knuckle's effective range, which is a really demanding effect effect just really points more to it being emitted rather than conjured. Knuckle also has a good idea where APR is when it is outside his effective range, functioning like a compass of sorts, which is either another additional effect if APR is indeed conjured, or just a simple consequence of Knuckle having a sense of where the aura emitted from his body is, and would again point us towards emission. I mentioned that Ikalgo being an enhancer barely made any sense whatsoever, and was a contender for the biggest category and ability type mismatch. But for now, I really do think Knuckle takes the cake. Ikalgo's ability to morph his body could simply be a benefit of his chimera and DNA. Octopi are able to shape their bodies after all, and flee them could simply be that taken to the extreme. Or it could simply be inherited from some kind of magical beast octopus. Or even magical beast squid that just really looks like an octopus. So what he could be doing, though I really don't think this is actually the case, is enhancing his already existent shapeshifting abilities. Knuckle does not have this benefit of the doubt, though, since the dude's a flesh-and-blood human. A badass one, but a human nonetheless. 
Also, we really can't explain the ability's seeming lack of effectiveness by a knuckle lacking proper training or guidance, since the dude was trained by none other than Morel McBuffroyd himself, and I really can't imagine him allowing Knuckle to create such an inefficient ability which only Castro could be proud of. Hakuware obviously exists since Knuckle is a beast hunter with a soft spot for animals. Since APR means that he can hit them all he wants without actually hurting them, this means that he could subdue most beasts, especially magical beasts who may have a greater affinity for Nan, without harming them. Despite this, I'm sure there were tons of different conjuration or even transmutation based abilities he could have come up with, without having to primarily rely on the Nan category directly opposite his own. Finally, we actually got the proficiency ranking for Knuckle, who is rated at excellent. I've already spent way too much on him in this video, so I'll just say that, uh, to me personally, this makes complete sense. Let's move on to yet another surprising entry on the list, uh, more for the fact that he is on the list in the first place, though that's not the only reason. Abengane? Abengane? I'm sorry, I have no idea how to pronounce his name. The final pure conjurer of the bunch. Abe is an exorcist, which apart from being his profession is actually a well-established subset of Nan abilities. He is able to exercise active Nan abilities by conjuring... in the case of Gen through this... Thing, which I genuinely like how even he finds excessively creepy, which then devours and effectively neutralizes active Nan abilities. The sleep paralysis demon, which you fear will suckle on your exposed toes and hence where you keep them under the covers even in summer, will remain snuggled up to the target of the Nan ability until the one who initially activated it is either dead, chooses to disarm it, or the conditions needed to lift it have been successfully met. The interesting part is that his ability actually borrows Nen from surrounding flora and fauna, spirit bomb style, which is a first. As such, the ability has to incorporate emission on some level as well. Since emission is the category directly opposite of conjuration, as we've established, thank you Knuckle, and is equally far apart on both sides of the diagram, it makes sense that he'd remain a pure conjurer since the pull wouldn't be coming from any specific direction. Though I really do think I may be overthinking this even more than usual. The genuinely surprising thing is his proficiency level, which is marked at extreme, the highest possible rank. Good for you, my guy. Good for you. Holy hell. I guess it's all just downhill from here. No, but seriously, not counting Hex characters like Meruem, Gonsan, and Aloka slash Nanika, he looks to be the youngest extreme-rated Nen user we have. And by a solid margin at that, he looks like he'd been his mid-30s at the most. We can't know for sure, but Aloka not included, cause of course not. He's probably one of the most powerful exorcists around. Alright, all done with pure conjurers, now we have three midpointers left. The first we're going to cover is Tsubune, who is a transmutation midpoint conjurer. The curviest woman in Hunter x Hunter has the ability to transform into, most likely seven, different vehicles via her ability Riders High, Perfect Girl 7 Transformations. I love you, Tagashi. Uh, since she's a symbiotic type, she actually needs a rider to provide the Nen and Field vehicle. I've actually referenced Tsubune a few times in previous videos, wherein I mostly mentioned how her ability kind of strains my suspension of disbelief as to what Nen can accomplish, so I won't focus on that here. You can check out 8 nonsensical Nen abilities if you'd like to hear more on that. I will, however, focus on the fact that she's a midpoint transmuter. The conjuration part makes sense, since she literally conjures various vehicle parts and molds her body to coherently facilitate them. Now, assuming she doesn't have any other Hatsu, I could think of two reasons why she'd be a transmutation midpointer. First, she needs to actually transmute the aura the rider provides into a substance that can be used to propel the vehicle. The ability would still need to utilize a mission to actually facilitate the transfer of aura from the rider to her, however. While conjurers do only have a 40% effectiveness in a mission, as we've well established, thank you, Knuckle, I imagine that wouldn't be that much of a problem in Tsubune's case, since she and the rider are in physical contact with each other, plus she is a symbiotic type. This means her ability cannot work without a second party, making it all the more powerful and deficient. However, it's very possible that transmutation isn't being used at all, and we're seeing pure emission at work. We've already seen that Bisky's level 5 emission training required Gon to actually propel himself through pure emission. This means that transmutation may not be necessary at all, and that the aura is emitted from the rider to Tsubune, who then uses that aura to propel them both. While difficult to tell in the manga, in the anime it does look like she's firing off pure aura. Also, due to her being a symbiotic type, the aura expelled by Tsubune may actually be greater than what the rider provides. Second, I've mentioned this on a few occasions already, but we know that Bisky isn't sure how her transformation really came about, only telling us that she intensely desired it. 
While we cannot be sure about the mechanics behind it, since Bisky is a pure transmuter, it could be that this is an obscure and or advanced application of transmutation, wherein what changes in shape and quality is the user's body, not just their nen. If so, the reshaping of Tsubune's body could require a high proficiency in transmutation. Manipulation is also a possibility, but we don't have confirmation on whether Illumi's face-changing ability is manipulation, transmutation, or once again, some pre nen Zoldic shenanigans. It's worth mentioning that while I do favor the second option, they are not actually mutually exclusive. Let's now move on to the worst best gambler around, Kite, who is the other transmutation midpoint conjurer. His Hatsu crazy slots allows him to summon 9 different types of, I'm assuming, weapons, all the while getting some great day obnoxious commentary from the semi-sentient clown that's responsible for their walls. I really want to know whether Kite made the clown so insufferable to just ever more slightly boost its power. As in, the clown mentioned himself that he only calls on him when he really deems it necessary. I like to think that the annoyance factor is a boost, but since Jing was the one who helped him develop crazy slots, that maybe it was just as much of a troll on Jing's part. Thus far, we've seen numbers 2 and 4 in action. Straight out of Soul Eater and the most badass one, number 2 is a conjured scythe, which cannot be dispelled until Silent Waltz, the embodiment of cutting things down to size, is used. Since the slash goes beyond the range of the physical scythe itself, either emission or enhancement are most likely being utilized. I don't think I need to go into how emission would make sense in this case, but since we don't see any actual lore emitted when Kaita waltzes, it's probable that pure enhancement is being used to greatly increase the power of the slash, and to such an extent that what's doing the actual cutting is pure wind pressure. Considering the limitations on the ability, such as the randomness factor, the fact that the attack itself has more wind-up time and priming than a Dark Souls boss, Kite's amazing Nen prowess, and him being a transmutation midpointer, which could mean that his aptitude for enhancement may be as high as 70%, wind breathing through pure enhancement is a definite possibility. Ability. Number 4 is a giant fuck off gun which is used to either fire conjured bullets or emitted aura. In the anime it's not really clear and in the manga Kai just off panels Yunju, which is the only time we see it used, so we have no way of knowing. Number 3, so the Hunterpedia refers to it as a mace, but I always saw it more as a wand or something, it's hard to tell. That's definitely not how you hold a mace though. And the thought of Kai turning into a magical girl is hell... Oh my god, he did actually turn into a magical girl. Moving on, what we do know about it is that the clown mentioned this to be a good number. Jing also mentioned that there's a number Kite will roll only when he's desperate to survive, and the clown's reaction could serve to imply that lucky number 3 is just that number. Considering Kite was already disarmed at this point, and was faced with Pito head on. <laughs> Apart from this, there's nothing we know about the ability proper, besides the fact that it could have somehow facilitated his reincarnation. Speaking of, we need to tackle an important point. The categories in the exhibition relate to characters as we last saw them in the series proper. This means that we do not know whether Kite was actually a transmutation midpoint conjurer prior to reincarnating. Considering Crazy Slot is fundamentally conjuration based, he was almost certainly nonetheless a conjurer, either pure, transmutation or specialization lean, or a transmutation midpoint as he is now. Though if what Jing said is actually true and Kite's ability played a role in seeing his mind actually imprinted onto the girl Koala killed, Apart from raising a few moral questions, though hunters tend to consider those only seldom, it's also difficult for me to wrap my hand around how this could have been done without specialization. Hence why I think that he may have been specialization lean. Seriously, if you do have any ideas as to how any of the five regular categories could have accomplished this feat, transmutation especially, since he's a midpointer, uh, please do comment down below. Finally, we have the most prolific Spider Riders detractor, both online and offline, Karapika Kurta, who is also the only specialization midpoint conjurer. This makes total sense, and if anyone deserves to be a midpoint specialist, it's Karapika. He's probably a pure conjurer baseline, while his Kurta eyes turn him into a special kind of specialist for a time, which he so modestly calls Emperor Time. Karapika has more or less mastered the use of ET. <laughs> no, no, no. ET? thank you, and can switch it on and off at will. Which means that he can go from conjurer to special specialist in a moment's notice. 
while in ET all of his abilities gain a boost from the fact that his force and accuracy, two terms which have never been properly defined or delineated from one another to this day, are increased. This for example makes the enhancement based healing chain much more effective. Apart from this, Krupika can also actually utilize specialization based abilities. While it's unclear whether Steel Chain, an ability that allows him to steal the abilities of others, does that remind you of someone Pika, utilizes specialization since the ability itself doesn't actually allow Krupika to use those abilities taking another's Hatsu seems to definitely nonetheless go beyond pure aura transference, such as Priro's Meruem and Knuckle have exemplified. So my guess would be that it would necessitate specialization. Stealth Dolphin, an ability paired with Steel Chain, which is meant to analyze and actually equip those abilities to either himself or others, definitely does though. Beyond this, I won't go into it anymore. Stent listing all of his abilities, explaining Emperor Time, and doing a deep dive on everything he's been stated or shown to be capable of would make the video twice as long as it actually is. Grapika is right at home at that specialist midpoint spot. And we're 4 for 6. I can finally see the horizon. As you may or may not be able to tell by my voice, my allergies are acting up, so I'm going to keep this short and simple. Thank you very much for helping me reach 1000 subs, it feels great to be monetized after all these years. Now I just need to put out some actual videos. Speaking of, I really do hope you enjoyed this one, feedback is always appreciated, and I'll see you in the next one. Oh, Murasaki. I get it.